most environmentalists today focus on climate and climate is a real issue. Um, and I've spent 40 years looking at that science, but what we've seen over the past couple of years is that that issue has been captured hijacked in many ways by the World Economic Forum and particularly by Bill Gates. They aggravate the problem and then sell us the solution. And of course, the solution that they want for climate is our more social controls, the big solution of geoengineering projects, which of course, Bill Gates is funding all over the world. And today, and I want to talk about geoengineering, and particularly as it's related to climate, because it is a threat that the environmental community needs to know about, and the rest of us need to know about. It is, it is a threat that is probably as dangerous to us as climate change itself. And that's why I've invited today to talk to us, Dane Wigginton, who is the producer of the groundbreaking climate engineering documentary film, The Dimming. And uh, Dane has a background in solar energy. He was a former employee of Bechtel um, and was a licensed contractor in California and Arizona. He's devoted the last 20 years of his life to in-depth research on the issue of covert global climate engineering operations and the effort to expose and to halt them. His personal residence was featured as a cover article in the world's largest renewable energy magazine, Home Power. He manages a wildlife preserve next to Lake Shasta in Northern California. Dana has appeared in numerous films and interviews in his effort to educate the public on the extremely dire environmental and health dangers that we face from the ongoing global climate intervention program. So welcome to the podcast, Dana. I'm so glad that you could join me. It's a pleasure and an honor, Robert. And your description is very accurate and on target. And the the paradox, the irony here is that we have a global power structure that thinks they can counter the damage already done by human activity, anthropogenic activity, which is in a sense a form of geoengineering because we're altering the planet's life support systems. And they are trying to sell us doing even more intervention as a form of a cure, much like you described the pharmaceutical industrial complex mentality. And this is the climate engineering issue itself, but we would argue at geoengineeringwatch.org that there can't be any legitimate discussion about climate or the state of the climate from any perspective without addressing this first and foremost. We would also argue that the state of the climate is even worse than we are being told, and climate engineering is further fueling that process, not mitigating it. Okay, so let's start with one thing that a lot of people have heard about, and, and nobody really knows what to think about it, but chemtrails is uh, are chemtrails real? And uh, and you know, tell us about them. Let's start with the appropriate place to start. What we're seeing in our skies are not condensation trails. In almost all cases, they are sprayed particulate trails, and we're not speculating. We have up close film footage of military tankers and commercial nozzles visible turning on and off geoengineeringwatch.org as a part of the film, The Dimming, at great effort and expense, we acquired a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration flying lab, put top scientists in it, took samples at altitude behind heavy aircraft. We sampled what they were emitting. The sample was processed at one of the top testing institutions in the world. We found exactly what we knew we would find, climate engineering elements, starting with aluminum, which is named in one of the most significant climate engineering patents. And the climate engineers themselves have stated their goal of putting tens of millions of tons of aluminum nanoparticles into the atmosphere annually as part of solar radiation management to block some of the sun's incoming thermal energy with no consideration of the consequences whatsoever. So, okay, you know, that this is a classic conspiracy theory, right? Chemtrails. People who talk about chemtrails are... Um, you know, are regarded as uh, uh, tinfoil hats. 
Um, so, so tell us, you know, what, what proof do we have that chemtrails are happening and, you know, who is doing it? Because you see, you know, I'm on a flight path coming into LAX and I see commercial aircraft with, uh, with contrails uh, coming out of their tails. So, and that's not, those aren't chemtrails. Where are those, you know, I assume are chemtrails, are they putting the aluminum particulates in commercial aircraft or is this all military aircraft or civilian contractors? And, you know, what, what kind of evidence do we have that it's going on? Unless you're seeing a plane landing with perhaps a wing vortex, which is certainly a benign phenomenon or a fuel dump. If you're seeing an aircraft emitting a trail at altitude, even a commercial aircraft, the chances are almost certain that that is a spray dispersion or a fuel additive happening in that aircraft, which is also part of climate engineering operations. Again, we have up close film footage of these aircraft, including commercial, turning on and off at altitude. That means that cannot be a condensation trail. These are up close images, KC-10s, KC-135, C-17 Globemasters, and commercial aircraft. We have extremely up close photographic images of the retrofit nozzles mounted on the wing pylons of commercial aircraft aimed into the exhaust jet stream. We are not implicating commercial pilots. We are not implicating commercial personnel. They are not involved to our knowledge, but their aircraft in many cases are being used. If you remember when the, the big luggage situation came into play in the airlines uh, around 2002, and suddenly it was a big concern how much luggage you carried on, how much weight there was, and so forth. And that is about the period in time when we feel the commercial industry was utilized more heavily for much lighter payloads than a, than a military plane can carry. And certainly these are automated systems. So again, we're not implicating commercial pilots or personnel, although we are working with some that behind the scenes are leaving geoengineeringwatch.org printed materials covertly in pilot lunchrooms and so forth. But again, as, as far as this not being condensation, let's look at another factor. All military tankers and all commercial aircraft are fitted with what's known as a high bypass turbofan jet engine. That's a jet powered fan. 80% of the air that moves through that engine is not combusted. That engine by design is nearly incapable of producing any condensation trail except under rare and extreme circumstances. And beyond all this, I would ask people to believe what they see with their own eyes. When you see an aircraft leaving a trail clear across the horizon that suddenly shuts off and it leaves nothing on the rest of its journey, or you see grid patterns in the sky one day and nothing the next with similar atmospheric patterns, of course, something is clearly wrong. And we see loops and uh, aircraft making large configurations in X's and, and so forth that we believe is to mark the air current movement. But high bypass turbofan jet engine, by design, nearly incapable of making condensation trail, nozzles visible, film footage turning on and off. And one more thing, if I could add to this, Robert, you certainly have seen all the B-17 bombers in World War II leaving the massive trails behind them, correct? Yeah. So we captured off the military archives film footage of one B-17 flying in formation under another, filming these massive dispersions from that aircraft and we, we got film capture of that being shut off instantaneously in air. That aircraft didn't fall. The aircraft all around it continued to disperse. That aircraft continued to fly in formation. Clearly, there was some sort of beta testing going on, which would make sense, because we know these programs were initially deployed immediately after World War II over the polar regions, which would make sense as well, because those are the air conditioners of the planet. They knew the poles were beginning to melt. And that would be the logical place for them to start. And then by the 50s, we had Stanford acknowledging a, quote, Arctic haze that contained aluminum in the haze. And they couldn't figure out where that aluminum was coming from. So, again, I could go on and on with various puzzle pieces. But we ask people to look at the data, not to believe what we say, and to consider, and I know this will hit home, close to home for you, given your family's background, which I so respect and revere. We have President Lyndon Johnson on film, on the record, when he was vice president in 62, stating that we had the power to control the world's cloud layer then, 60 years ago, and quote, he who controls the weather controls the world. On film, on the record, that's the lead in 30 seconds to every weekly geoengineering watch commercial free global alert news broadcast, which is on 16 stations around the country. So I, I, maybe you've seen that, but for those listeners that haven't, I would encourage them to watch that. 
It lays the predicate and the foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather. And he who controls the weather will control the world. And, and it would seem that there would be thousands of pilots and thousands and thousands of people who would be who would have to be aware of this program and be participating in it. Um, how come we don't see more whistleblowers coming out, particularly people who are retired? Excellent question. We have right now an illegal gag order on all the nation's weathermen, National Weather Service and NOAA. And that is a massive red flag. Why in the world would our government feel the need to gag the weathermen? Next, we have massive compartmentalization. We know in, in Vietnam, for example, did the pilot find the aircraft spraying Agent Orange on the ground, which eventually killed many U.S. soldiers, as you know. Was he told that that would kill his partner on the ground? Of course not. So it's, it's massive compartmentalization. And, and those that do know, we would argue, are being told they're doing something benevolent. If it's military personnel, they're certainly being told they're doing something benevolent for the greater good. And now let's add this. We know, according to the Washington Post, as of as far back as 1977, the Washington Post recorded that there had been no less than 239 open-air biological tests conducted on the U.S. population by the U.S. military without their knowledge or their consent. So again, th th there are so many factors that connect to this. And, and finally, given the severity of what we face, and, and I would argue we don't face global warming, we face something far worse. We face what would be scientifically termed an abrupt climate collapse. There are so many feedback mechanisms now that have been triggered, like the methane release happening in the Arctic, and the acceleration of those events is so severe that I think it would be very naive for our population to believe that governments around the globe wouldn't engage in these operations without public knowledge or consent. And a final factor, we have a U.S. Senate document 800 pages long that outlines global cooperation between major governments, major superpowers, even if they have, quote, otherwise adversarial relations, they will cooperate in the climate engineering operations because you can't just climate engineer over one country without affecting the entire world. Within that document, there is a provision for total legal immunity for anyone and everyone involved. And is it mainly, I mean, the, the frightening thing about this, and I know that there's been many, many tests now that are showing accumul uh, accumulations of, of aluminum, even in places in very, very remote parts of the earth, I mean, in the soils. And it's hard to explain why that would happen. And, and people should know this, that aluminum... Um, was never a, a free molecule prior to the World War II era. Aluminum, uh, all the aluminum on Earth is bound into silicate. And so it wasn't like there are many, many other metals like iron, et cetera, that are in the seawater and that, um, and zinc and magnesium, et cetera, that, um, that, are, uh, that are free and biologically available. But aluminum was was really not biologically available prior to World War II, prior to the, and particularly the airline industry, um, when aluminum smelting became uh, very, very widespread. And then, of course, the aluminum got into our cookware, it got into uh, aluminum cans, it got into, um, you know, food storage, etc. And we now know that aluminum gets stored in the brain. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. It has a high association with Alzheimer's and with many, many other brain injuries and other injuries. And, um, and so it's kind of frightening to think that somebody may be putting large amounts of bioavailable aluminum into the environment I'm spraying it in, in microscopic particulates uh, from airplanes. You're completely correct on every point. Thank you for bringing that point up, that aluminum does not exist naturally in the environment in free form, always bonded to other elements. And we now have lab tests from around the world, all of which contain some level of aluminum. That's what brought me into this fight. When I began to lose massive amounts of my solar power uptake, I, I spent my whole life trying to get out of the smoggy Southern California, moved to the Pacific Northwest, built this off-grid home. 
It was losing huge amounts of my solar power uptake from whatever these aircraft were emitting, which I knew could not be condensation, not to block 70 or 80% of my solar PV uptake on some days. And that doesn't mean there's an 80% reduction in overall light. It just means you, you have to have direct sunlight for solar panels to function. I began to test my precipitation, did not want to find that primary element of aluminum, but I did. I continued to test my precipitation. In the course of 18 months, the amount of aluminum in a single precipitation event went from 7 ppb parts per billion to 3,450 ppb in a single rain event. That's highly toxic rain. So much aluminum is falling in our region of Northern California. It has altered soil pH values from 10 to 12 times toward alkaline. Rain pH should be about 5, 6, 5.6 based on atmospheric carbon loading. We're seeing now 6, 6, 6, 8 in some cases. We're testing the individual precipitation events. The precipitation that is very high in aluminum is actually pushing the pH value toward neutral. And the in regard to where else that might be coming from, because that's a question people ask. Maybe there's some industry across the street from me or so forth. We know from CARB, California Air Resources Board, that when they're testing from the aerosols from China, Japan, Asia, there's nothing between us and them. And CARB studies do not show aluminum migrating across the ocean. Mercury can, of course, because it converts to a gaseous state, but not aluminum. So where is that much metal coming from? And a final note, your viewers, your followers, can watch the world's most recognized geoengineer, Dr. David Keith, who works for Mr. Gates, works with Mr. Gates, works for Harvard as well. It's about the fact, an uncomfortable fact, but it is a fact that we have the technical ability to do this. They are all fast acting, they are cheap, and they are fundamentally imperfect. And the problems of how you control something where an individual country can have tremendous leverage over the whole planet's climate and where there are winners and losers in ways that, that really could be unpredictable. And I mean, not to frighten you, but I think you can imagine scenarios that lead to war. Another example is the array of technologies, often referred to collectively as geoengineering, that potentially could help reverse the warming effects of global climate change. One that has gained my personal attention is stratospheric aerosol injection. There's all sorts of ways you could do this, uh, but the standard idea has always been you spray sulfuric acid in the stratosphere 20 kilometers over our head, and use that to stop the planet warming up. The example many people cite was when uh, the Mount Pinatubo volcano uh, exploded and uh, all of this ash went into the air and had a cooling effect on the earth. And so people have long proposed since the mid 60s that you could artificially add dust to the stratosphere and cool the planet. Not that this would be a good solution for global warming, it would not. But it does show the way we're steadily developing the powers to manipulate the planet with comparative ease. That sulfur in the lower atmosphere is masking some mm -hmm. of the climate warming from CO2. So is this the global dimming or something? Yeah. Uh, Other leading idea is basically to emulate what big volcanoes do, put material in the stratosphere to reflect sunlight. So the problem is the following. If you add SO2 to the stratosphere, SO2 doesn't condense. So you might want to put alumina in. Alumina has a very high nature of refraction. It's very small. It doesn't coagulate. And you can engineer particles that have particular properties. You can get them out of the stratosphere. You can concentrate particles near the poles. Costs are so cheap that the richest people on the planet could perhaps afford to buy an ice age. It's extraordinarily cheap. I knew it was cheap when I found that they were quoting me in tons. It's also true that particles, as they get bigger, fall out a lot faster. We sort of step back and think, OK, well, how would you actually make particles in the stratosphere? This is really engineering now. And if it was aerosols in the stratosphere, it would likely be put there by airplanes. Start with a fleet of just two or three kind of modified business jets. The basic idea is that if you let a plume off in an aircraft by just changing some little details, you can actually get much smaller particle size distributions by doing this kind of spraying. So there are all sorts of side effects. I'll get to them in a second. But, but if you put sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, for example, you could deplete stratospheric ozone. Smaller size means more surface area, uh, uh, but more surface area means less ozone. Oh, uh, is this stuff in the stratosphere going to be killing some number of people that are going to be so sort of just, sacrificed? It, it's, a, it's an obvious concern. <laughs> so if it kills a million people and we're only bad. doing 1% more, we're just killing 10,000 more people. You can do math. Okay. But that's, so, so killing people is not the objective here. <laughs> so if I made a decision or if it was a collective decision to do a geoengineering program, 
and you put, say, uh, the kind of program I think makes more sense, we put about a million tons a year in, but let's say, you might end up killing many tens of thousands of people a year as a direct result of that decision. And so the only thing that we can do to cool the planet or that society can do to cool the planet is deploy these sorts of technologies. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. It's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. It's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. And it means there are going to be winners and losers, just like there are winners and losers for CO2, but there are different winners and losers. So this makes the problem, if anything, harder to solve. You've introduced another dimension of complexity into the managing the planet's climate problem world's most recognized geoengineer at an international geoengineering conference presenting his proposal to put 10 to 20 million tons of aluminum nanoparticles into the atmosphere annually. And on film, on the same footage, which is on the Dimming documentary, I confronted Dr. Keith at that presentation, at that conference, asking him, had any toxicological studies been done whatsoever on these particles? His first response was, well, we studied the amount of atmospheric aerosol particular loading Particulate loading, paraphrase, there's a lot of material or a lot of particles up there. A few more won't hurt. And before they cut me off, I followed up with those particles aren't aluminum. Have you studied aluminum? And what the world's most recognized geoengineer said, no, could terrible things happen tomorrow? We don't know. Numerous air quality studies, uh, including from the uh, CARB, California Air Quality Resource Board, have named submicron sized particulates as being particularly harmful for human respiration. Through all the discussions today, uh, I have not heard any mention of this fallout, and has, has this been studied, and also the effects of a highly reactive metal like aluminum on toxifying soils and waters? The question is, what would be the effects of these materials on human health? They came down into the stratosphere, yeah, and, uh, in, in particular, uh, small particles of aluminum. We, in our climate model, we looked at how much additional acid rain, acid, acid snow you would get from the sulfur coming out of the stratosphere if you did it at a rate of five megatons per year or 10 megatons per year of sulfate. And it turns out that amount is so much smaller than what humans put into the troposphere on an annual basis by burning fossil fuels as a byproduct. That even in pristine areas, the soil would have a burning capacity and the it wouldn't be harmful. So, so. so the, the collaborators in my working on the aerosol scheme are actually folks from Carnegie Mellon who focused on human health impacts. And while we haven't published it, that was the very first thing we did, was do the order of magnitude calculation in the federal pencil paper, but with an expert on human health impacts about whether there could be an issue. And the answer is no clear cut no. So for the numbers of particles that are running the charts here are so tiny compared to the loadings on human health. There are other things that worry me a lot, like the rain on these particles in the upper troposphere when they might affect high clouds. And, and for aluminum or other particles, there are a lot of toxicological things that need to get looked at seriously. But if you just think about the sheer number of particles and the human health impact of small particles, the answer is, well, we haven't published it. That was the first thing we looked at with some of the leading experts who do heavy uh, emotional research on human health impacts and it's not even close to the issue. 10 megatons of aluminum dumped into the, the uh, atmosphere would have no human health impacts. So, so let me be more careful here. We're let's separate out the toxicological but So the aluminum, we've only begun to research and publish nothing. The question I was asking was about purely about particle number density. So what we did is we said, we looked at some global estimates now we have of, 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 of aerosol global estimates that were built for epidemiological purposes of the global loading of aerosols in terms of health impacts. And we said if we added on top of that what we're doing from the stratospheric aerosols, could it have any impact? And the answer is that that was totally irrelevant. But that was just on particle number. We haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. We haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. They banned me from the subsequent conferences for asking that question. Yeah, I mean, the ironic thing about Gates is that Gates has, and I've documented this in my book and in a bunch of articles, he has these huge, um, uh, these vast investments in carbon industries, in the coal industry, in most of the big oil companies, uh, he had when when I was you know when I last researched this and I'm not sure it's still true but it, I know there's no reason to believe that it isn't but he owned um, uh, 
uh, manufacturing facilities for private airplanes or um, maintenance facilities for pri- you know, you a private airplane company. Um, he owns a, a big stock a stake in the railroads. And I think about 20 percent of rail, and I could be wrong about this, but it's, it's going to be close. About 20 percent of railroad revenues, um, I think, come from carrying coal. Um, and and so he he had a, he has a portfolio that is very very heavily um, carbon. Of course, he flies private everywhere, and he's uh, you know the Davos as they all do. So he doesn't seem particularly concerned about global warming. And you know, I was in the environmental movement for forty years. I I didn't um, work. Uh, directly on climate because I mainly focused on pollution issues, which are related because they're coming from the same factories, but and for the same power plants and cement kilns, etc. Uh, but I, I was working for organizations like NRDC, which were very heavily involved in climate, and Gates never contributed to these organizations. He was not contributing to climate advocacy like maybe you know some of the other. Uh, like uh, Ted Turner and Bloomberg and the other people who talk about climate a lot, they were giving money to people who were advocating for you know laws to do it and subsidies to the carbon industry and these kind of things. But Gates really was never involved in doing those things. So his involvement in, you know, then he goes ahead and writes a book on climate this year and he starts pretending that he's a a big climate activist, but he's never been involved in climate activism. The only thing that he's been involved in is, as far as I know, is funding these big geoengineering projects. That seemed just insane. And, you know, my whole life I've been, um, you know, a lot of what I do is is fighting people who have, who are trying to impose engineering solutions on environmental problems. You know, God designed the planet to, to work pretty well, and um, and usually trying to fix it with an engineering solution is like whack a mole. It just causes more problems down the line. And if you're going to do a big, big large scale engineering solution, you know, dams, dikes, lakes, etc. You better look at all of the the um, unanticipated results of that. All they're thinking is, we have a problem. Here is an engineering solution. Don't ask me about any of the of the collateral damage from that solution. And that you know, it's it seems insane that somebody would sprinkle aluminum dust into the atmosphere, which we know is deadly toxic to the human brain. We've been dealing a lot with some military activity in terms of mm-hmm. chaff anyway, and that's something that I experienced for the first time yesterday. That was a whole lot of fun. And that's where the military just basically dumps uh, some of the, the, the tiny particles of plastic or um, metal, mylar, into the atmosphere. And when you see this kind of a pattern like this, you can rest assured there's something going on. They're actually little bitty magnetic and little bitty strips of whether it's aluminum. Then you see these bands of very distinct cloud cover moving into the region. That is not rain, that is not snow. Believe it or not, military aircraft flying through the region is dropping chaff. Small bits of aluminum, sometimes it's made of plastic or uh, even uh, metallicized, uh, metallicized paper products, but it's used as an anti-radar issue and obviously they're up there practicing. Now they won't confirm that, but I was in the Marine Corps for many years and I'll tell you right now, that's what it is. Exactly what the world's most recognized geoengineer and Dr. David Key said at this conference, the premise for him pushing aluminum as the element of choice is because it has a high albedo, high reflectivity, and low coagulation rate. And again, with no consideration of the consequences, we have lab tests from all over the globe, aluminum in all of them. In addition to barium, strontium, manganese, polymer fibers, the last 100 plus tests contained graphene. The tests contain surfactants, which we know from what we believe to be the primary material supplier. American Elements Institute surfactants are used to keep the nanoparticles from coagulating before they're dispersed. We see foaming rain everywhere. That's indicative of surfactants in the mix. We've tested frozen precipitation, 
it is packed with surfactants, which would be one reason why the snow is especially slippery now. In regard to the aluminum and the dispersions over the oceans, we believe that solar radiation management operations, stratospheric aerosol injection, and most of these operations are taking place in the troposphere, not the stratosphere. But we well, explain that. that how how far how high is the troposphere? The stratosphere. It well, go ahead. Depend, depends entirely on location. Stratosphere in the polar regions can be as low as 23,000 feet, which means they can definitely spray in the stratosphere over the polar regions. Even some of the lower latitudes can be as low as 30, 33,000 feet. So some of these operations are taking place in the stratosphere when, where the stratosphere is at lower elevations. But what we believe is also occurring over the oceans is a and dual where purpose. Is the tro and the troposphere is where? It's lower altitudes? Generally, at the mid-latitudes, it would be high 30,000s in that range. And again, it, it depends on location on the planet. Depends on their atmospheric conditions can vary as well. But most, most aircraft fly in the upper troposphere, and that's where we're seeing dispersions. But we're seeing dispersions even at mid-latitudes as low as 20,000 feet. That's low. These particles don't stay aloft long. The lower the altitude, the larger the payload the aircraft can carry. And that may be one of their considerations. At lower altitudes, a KC-135 can carry 100 tons of material in a single payload. These are astoundingly high numbers of, of this particulate, and it and would correlate to what we're seeing in, in the soil pH changes. And, and back to ocean iron fertilization, that's another proposal for geoengineering to fertilize the oceans, to force them to uptake more CO2. And we would argue this has already been occurring for decades that the SRM, solar radiation management dispersions that are happening over our oceans, are also part of ocean iron fertilization. And that would correlate with studies we have, peer-reviewed studies of, for example, whales that are packed with alarming levels of aluminum. And as you stated, with all these organisms, aluminum toxic to virtually all life forms, no exception. And we see marine mammals like whales with peer-reviewed study that are packed full of aluminum. We have science study advocating for uh, polymer coated aluminum particles to be used in ocean iron fertilization. So again, there are so many puzzle pieces that connect and clearly- no, When you say the whales, because I've seen studies of beluga whales in the mouth of the St. Lawrence that are packed with aluminum. I mean, the, the highest aluminum levels ever found in living organisms in those whales, but, the, but that's because there's aluminum smelters, presumably, you know, all along the, the St. Lawrence, those Canadian aluminum smelters that are operating on uh, Canadian hydropower. Aluminum, as you know, to separate the aluminum from the bauxite, which is where geologically it occurs, you need tremendous heat and it's very expensive to smelt. And so the, you know, places like uh, like Greenland or Iceland rather and, and Canada that have a lot of hydropower um, are very, very, you know, uh, are, the, are the location of choice for the aluminum smelters. Where you have cheap, cheap power. And so there's a lot of aluminum in the beluga whales there, but are you saying there's whales in the ocean that are have alumina, have high aluminum levels? Yes, with peer-reviewed science study. There are no smelters in my region of Northern California. Lake Shasta is in my backyard, along with the upper Sacramento River. I have been invited and included in closed door meetings with Reading Environmental Health. That's the city furthest north in California shown the lab tests for the massive spikes of aluminum in the rivers. This is the drinking water for California, massive spikes in aluminum after every storm event. They didn't know where this metal was coming from. They've never disclosed these tests to date. So again, the, the level of cover up here is beyond comprehension. I've had private meetings in the Capitol with Governor Gavin Newsom, who knows this is going on, won't say anything. All the environmental groups you mentioned, all of them, WWF, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, Earth Justice, all of them. Our attorneys at geoengineeringwatch.org have spoken to their attorneys about this issue. They will not dis they will not bring this issue up in any of their organizations because they don't want to lose their 501c3 nonprofit. We find that to be unimaginably hypocritical because the data to back this up is absolutely monumental. You know, I, I got to push back on that because I, you know, I know these environmental leaders and I know their environmental groups and nobody's worried about losing their 501c3 by taking a, 
a tough stand on an issue. Uh, there may be other reasons why they're not doing it. That would not be a reason. You know, they're they're not going to yeah, yeah they're not going to lose a five hundred one c three by by criticizing the United States government. They, they can't do that to you. I think that probably the reason they won't don't want to do it is that um it's regarded as a as a as a crazy person's issue it's regarded as they and and i you know i i don't think of it that way but it's easy as you know it's people you know you take a lot of strength to do what you're doing you're obviously very well informed you've researched this stuff very well um, I'm persuaded by what you're saying, but you know you must have had the experience of people dismissing this issue as something that just is too crazy to even contemplate. And I think the environmental groups are very wary to get involved. They feel they'll be marginalized if they get in. They only half believe it, you know. They only half believe that it's happening. I can only convey what, what our attorneys have told us that their attorneys told them. So again, if there's other reasons and I'm, I'm, I, I can't know what their ultimate motivation is, but, but that's what we've been told. They won't even look at this issue. And I would ask this, how preposterous is it when we have the entire climate science community all over the globe describing exactly what we see in our skies as something we need to do immediately to deploy stratospheric aerosol injections, solar radiation management, jet aircraft spraying particles into the sky to block some of the sun's incoming thermal energy. And we have film footage of exactly this happening with literally whole horizons covered from what jet aircraft emit. This is uh, time-lapse film footage. We have the exact elements named in multiple climate engineering patents. We have about 150 listed at geoengineeringwatch.org. Those same elements showing up in absolutely alarming quantities on the ground. We have a condition now called global dimming, which is the amount of direct sunlight no longer reaching the surface of the planet that's staggeringly high. We have also global stilling, another science term, which means the overall wind flow around the planet is being diminished. We have a radical reduction in overall precipitation around the globe. Yes, we have deluge in many places, but overall we have much more protracted drought. The laws of physics say that can't happen on a rapidly warming planet because the atmosphere holds 7% more moisture for every degree C of warming, we believe from frontline temperatures that we are past three and a half degrees C right now, not one and a half, three and a half. And so how can we have that reduction in the hydrological cycle, that level of global dimming, the reduction of wind flow, which would be related to a interference with convection on the planet, all of those dots connect to what we know climate engineering consequences to be. And there's one more big one that's very alarming. We are seeing extraordinarily high levels of UVC on the surface, not just extreme levels of UVB. We are detecting UVC. We have a former NASA contract engineer that works directly for geoengineeringwatch.org with equipment we supplied him, state-of-the-art equipment. And we are told UVC stops 100,000 feet up in the atmosphere. Peer-reviewed study six months ago from a group of scientists acknowledged the UVC on the surface, and they were attacked immediately. And that, that study was swept under the rug. We're seeing other evidence of that. We're seeing bark scorch on the Cambrian layer of trees from tip to trunk. We're seeing plankton population decline off the scale. And we know plankton feed in the upper layers of the water column, so the UVC would certainly wreak havoc with their populations. Recent peer-reviewed study shows in the Atlantic a 90% decline in plankton. Peer-reviewed study. We see the evidence of everything we would expect with climate engineering, including the elements on the ground. And yet we're told that this is some sort of fringe issue when every single government in the globe is discussing it. Every single climate scientist is discussing it. And we have a history of weather modification going back 75 years. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll push back on the hydrological cycle because of what the, you know, the, the most of the modeling suggests that, that I've been reading for 40 years is that you're going to get a lot more rainfall in coastal regions. But because of the heat, the excess heat, in the uh, in interiors of the continents, it's going to get much drier. That, I mean that uh, you you uh, I mean that obviously if you've got a, a hotter atmosphere, you're going to have more evaporation, more precipitation, and the 
the question is where does it um where does that precipitation uh, ring out of the clouds does it do it and you know do they uh between the coast and the coastal ranges or does it make it in the interior of the of the country but uh, you know all of the issues that you're talking about make sense i think we do agree on the on the drought situation we're not saying that with a rapidly warming planet you wouldn't have these drought prone areas in interior regions what we're speaking about is overall precipitation and overall global precipitation is down not up and again laws of physics make clear seven percent more moisture for every degree c of warming and we know with the type of ocean fertilization programs that we believe are being conducted if there's polymer fibers in that there's been polymer fibers in our precipitation testing here that would certainly inhibit evaporation over the oceans the blocking of direct sunlight absolutely inhibits where, where evaporation. The, is, the, is the poly, polymer fiber is that another um, particulate that they use to block the um to block the the energy of the sun it's in the patents yes and even mentioned in, in david Keith's even mentioned in David Key's presentation, the polymer fibers being used as a means to keep the particles aloft longer, just like a spider web does for those types of spiders that migrate in the atmosphere. That is the thinking behind the use of polymer fibers. Dane, so, let me ask you one thing. Do, do, who owns the patents? Are they big like military contractors or? U.S. government owns many of the primary ones. The patents holder is signed to U.S. government. Raytheon holds many. Lockheed Martin holds many. And by the way, to tie those two private defense contractors into this scenario, we know that Lockheed Martin and Raytheon do all the weather modeling for the nation's weathermen that have the federal gag order on them. Lockheed Martin are neck deep in climate engineering patents and climate engineering operations. So we have the foxes literally running the hen house for the, quote, scheduled weather and that's how even down to the local meteorologist level, we have them predicting a, quote, mostly sunny day a week in advance here, for example, in Northern California. And on that day, there's not a natural cloud in the sky. There's only sprayed aerosol dispersions. How did that meteorologist know seven days in advance that that was going to occur? So, again, we know <laughs> we know that they're doing the weather modeling for National Weather Service and know, in fact, that has to be because they need to control the narrative and that's exactly what they're doing okay two questions one is uh you say that all of the weather the weathermen are you talking about the television weathermen are under a gag order does this thing no, crazy no, no no national weather service and national oceanic and atmospheric administration okay so they're under a gag order do, you, do we know what the gag order says it's a general gag order. It was sent to us in the mail in an unmarked envelope when it was first issued. But it's a it's a general gag order that restricts them from discussing any of the, the organization's uh, conduct or operations. It restricts them from discussing anything about the organization's operations. And as far as getting down to a local meteorologist level, certainly that's a matter of protecting paychecks and pensions. They know how long their leash is. But there's no reason a local... TV weathermen would know anything about this anyway. I mean, I, I don't think they need to be uh, read into the to the program because they're they were they aren't if they aren't part of it they wouldn't know. But um, again, I want to go I want to go back to this other issue that I talked to you about that I really didn't kind of I don't I still don't know. But is it your theory that a lot of this is happening from the commercial aircraft that we ride on? You know, when it, if I have to go to New York or something, is it possible that that airline for American Airlines is spraying this stuff and the pilot doesn't know about it? Two potential scenarios there. I'll answer that in a moment. I just want to back up to local meteorologists. We're not at oh. all implying that they are, they're part of it, it being included in any of these uh, operations as far as uh, in the know. We're simply stating that they certainly know they're reading scripts. They are definitely reading scripts. They put out the same narrative. We see them change that narrative at the same time as the weather bounces all over the board because these programs do exactly what you described earlier, weather whack-a-mole. So we're not implying with them or the commercial pilots and personnel, they're not involved, but certainly they know. We're communicating with, communicating with some commercial pilots and, and, and personnel. So um, just trying to, to separate that out. On the rest of two scenarios, as I stated a moment ago, we know that the US DOD is leasing no less than 400 commercial aircraft with commercial markings. Why would they need 400 commercial aircraft with commercial markings? Next, again, as far as what commercial pilots know, and we're communicating with them, so 
we know that they know, but they're not saying anything about this. We have a much smaller payload carried with a commercial aircraft. It may be as low as 5% as a military tank or fully loaded, but we know that they're dispersing because we have up close images of them doing so, turning on and off. And you don't hit that kind of vertical layering in the atmosphere. It, it's layered horizontally. So you're not going to have a trail that cuts off like it was cut with a knife. That's, that's not possible atmospherically. So um, again, yes, commercial aircraft are being used. We can't know if the particular aircraft with the particular commercial markings is necessarily carrying passengers or not. But the U.S. military leasing many of those aircraft. Next, the U.S. military tanker fleet. We have the U.S. military owns and controls three times more aerial tankers than all other militaries in the world combined. And if I can add one more historical fact into this, I think would have relevance for everybody given global events. We have, for example, after 9-11, we had General Wesley Clark stating on the record that the Middle Eastern countries that were to be targeted, a list that we believe existed before 9-11 even occurred. But my point is this, that those Middle Eastern countries, every single one subsequently underwent a once in 1,000 year drought. That's mathematically, statistically impossible to have that kind of coincidence unless there was something else in the equation. That's something else we would argue is climate engineering. And to back that up, we have leaders of some of those countries in the case of Iran on the floor of the United Nations stating emphatically that NATO was cutting off their precipitation, destabilizing food production, thus destabilizing populations. We know that Iran's a target of NATO. It has been for a very long time. Next, if we look at the satellite imagery off of the California coast, for example, we can see these operations occurring. We're not guessing or speculating. We can see them completely breaking up the storm track. And I would encourage you listeners to view presentations that I did almost a decade ago, engineered drought catastrophe target California. Every single thing I said would happen here has happened. Not because I was looking into a crystal ball, but because I was looking at data. And if these programs continued, it had to happen. And it did. Yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you one of the reasons that I kind of hate this um you know my mind is open to to this is because woody harrelson one time was at my house and he was talking about this this is probably 10 years ago and i was saying come on that's just that's ridiculous that's impossible and he said come outside with me and we went outside and we sat on a hillside and we watched these planes fly in a grid pattern laying out this uh you know, a grid of, of contrails, and then it turned into clouds, and we had a cloudy day. And I don't know, you know, I've looked up many times since then and seen that happening, and I don't have a good explanation for it. But, you know, the things that you're saying um, are, uh, are consistent, are internally consistent, and they're consistent with things that I've observed. Uh, it's amazing to think that they can keep it that secret that well for this long but you know i've seen them do that with other things as well we have to stand back and understand given the severity of biosphere collapse and, and based on the statistical mathematical trajectory if we continue on this course none of us are going to be here that much longer we have global wildlife populations crashing right now that we've lost 70 percent of global wildlife populations in the last four years, some sites citing fifty. Yeah, but, but there's a lot of other reasons that's happening too. I certainly. Know, you can't oh, I'm not blaming. I'm not, no, 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 no. I'm not. I, I mean, I'm the not, thing, not, the thing that to me that is really um, kind of you know, I I'm not going to say dispositive, but really hard to explain is that I've seen all of this data. You know, uh, that uh, that the, about the aluminum concentrations dramatically increasing in national forest lands and other places that are completely remote from any smelter. And as you say, aluminum, unlike mercury, precipitates out of the atmosphere within, a, a, you know, 100, 200 miles from a smelter. Oh, if you're on the West Coast and the nearest smelter is in, you know, upwind smelter is in Japan or China, the aluminum, there's no explanation for all that aluminum, those aluminum concentrations in national forests on the West Coast. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't. 
if I could just back it for the record, I definitely did not mean to imply in any way that what's happening could be blamed entirely on climate engineering. Not at all. We've been unimaginably poor stewards of the planet. I, I mean, where would we start? I lectured on global warming before I focused all on climate engineering. So, I mean, yeah, we're poisoning the oceans. We're cutting down our forests. We're paving the planet, dumping nuclear waste everywhere. So I, I certainly recognize all of that. I'm just simply stating as an aggregate that given the severity of our situation, given the severity of climate collapse, why would we think that governments around the globe wouldn't deploy this in a last ditch effort to keep business as usual until the last possible moment? And I would argue that's exactly what they're doing. And even if I could, before I get, I forget to include this, a key part of climate engineering is engineering winter weather events. And that's key right now because we have winter storm Elliot being manipulated in the U.S., in regard to the validity of that ma manipulation, the climate engineers being able to seed endothermic reacting elements, energy absorbing elements into clouds to create a cold dense layer that descends to the surface and create frozen precipitation out of what would have been liquid precipitation. I would cite, if your listeners search Chinese scientists create artificial snowstorm, they'll find popular science covered it, Fox News, MSNBC, and everybody else. They did $2 billion worth of damage to Beijing by nucleating clouds into frozen precipitation. They stopped talking about it after that. We have the patents for this. We've tested the frozen precipitation. And, and again, we have snow falling in places at 40 degrees. How does that happen? We have patents that based on elements like ammonium, barium, urea, stating that those patents can nucleate cloud moisture at temperatures 40 and 45 degrees. All of these dots connect when they do this and they create a flash cold event. It serves the carbon industry very, very well because they can come up with lots of new records or cold temperatures. It skews public perception as to the true state of the warming on the planet. It confuses them, divides them, and again, creates a lot of low temperatures that skew the global data for the year, which keeps us from having record high months and years when we otherwise would have. So there are so many complexities here around climate engineering that serve those in power to keep business as usual until the last possible moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the other parts of your story that, you know, is important to understand is the, the military programs to weaponize climate, because, of course, they're doing that. Of course, we I know they're doing that because they, you know, they do it with everything else. They do it with chemicals. They do it with biology. Anything that they can weaponize, they're going to. And what you just said about Iran, if you're involving civilians in that program, in a program that is attached to the weaponization of climate, um, or the way, yeah, the weaponization of weather, um, you can maybe force them to sign state secrecy contracts and everything else to make sure that, you know, and of course, if you, you violate a state secret, there's 4.3 million Americans who, according to Kevin Shipp, who, who was running that program for the CIA, who have signed state secrecy agreements. So if you're uh, uh, um, if you're involved with the civilian application of you know of these geoengineering projects, and if they're being run by the Department of Defense, and they come to you and say, or the intelligence agencies, and they say, um, we want you to be part of this, uh, and we, but you need to sign a state secrecy agreement. Then you're never going to talk about it. Then you go to jail for 20 years, and you lose every every possession you have, and you don't get a lawyer either. So anyway, I, I that's I think that's an aspect that makes the secrecy explainable. Um, you know, the the fact that they are probably militarizing this to and weaponizing it to attack other countries, to hurt other countries, uh, you know, crop production, et cetera. I would fully agree. And, and Kevin's an exceptional human being. I know Kevin. He's a friend as well. And uh, he's certainly spoken on this issue in the film The Dimmy. And this plugs into one of your earlier questions, too, Robert. You know, those that have stepped forward that are retired. In our groundbreaking documentary, The Dimming, there are two U.S. Air Force generals, a brigadier general and a two-star general, both acknowledging this issue on film on the record. Former Canadian Minister of Defense acknowledging this issue on the record. Former Premier for British Columbia, the same. I went to the government in Ottawa under Freedom of Information. It was a 40-page report of which half the pages were completely blank. 
and the other half had a lot of blank outs. But there was sufficient information to tell me that, yeah, they're aware. They call it geoengineering. We have former Forest Service scientists, former fish and game scientists, all in that film, acknowledging this issue on the record. So there are some courageous individuals out there, and we simply are trying to get others to step forward. And I've been in the field with USDA scientists that I know testing forced floor pHs. And we have the baseline values, by the way. I want to make that clear. I have the original USDA baseline values in my possession. So we know how much they've escalated. But I've had these USDA scientists in the field looking at me very sheepishly. They know this is going on and saying, what do you want us to do about it? They, they don't want to jeopardize their employment. And they're not saying a thing. All right. Well, give me some advice here. If we're, if you know, for people who are listening to this podcast, and they are, they have questions and really want to figure out uh, whether this is going on. What, what, where can they see this happening? Where, you know, where can you, you know, what they, should they look for in their own lives and their own, you know, as they would sort of walk around? What, what kind of signs of this should they look for? And then I'm going to ask you, um, if people have questions about this, where, the, where should they go to get good information? First about science, and there's some, a, a few major issues that we don't even see the agricultural industry acknowledging. One, we know bioavailable aluminum is toxic to root systems. We have peer-reviewed science study to confirm that. So it not only kills soil microbiome, but root systems, for example, in trees and forests, sense the toxin, they shut down nutrient uptake, they start to die a slow protracted death. And we have the so-called experts in governmental agencies telling us it's just the beetles. Beetles are simply a symptom of a tree that's sick and dying. And we have aquatic and terrestrial insect life completely crashing. Geoengineering Watch acknowledged that in, in 2012, that insect populations were collapsing. The climate science or the science community tried to marginalize us for that. Now they're admitting to it. We have another condition. And for those that are trying to grow gardens, to answer your question, their production is likely falling very rapidly. In addition to the soils being compromised, soil microbiome being harmed, soil pH values being affected, we have a condition called VPD, vapor pressure deficit. These particles, depending on what they're dispersing, are desiccants. So it's reducing atmospheric RH, relative humidity. This may be one of their goals because water vapor is also a greenhouse gas. And they may be trying to reduce atmospheric RH in their myopic attempt to slow the visible signs of the warming. But what VPD does, if there's not enough humidity, the organism, be it trees, other types of flora, vegetables, they shut down their stomata, their respiratory ports. They stop breathing. Forests do not smell like forest anymore because the trees are not respirating. They're, they're not absorbing carbon. They're not releasing oxygen. Now we know that forests, even like the Amazon, are not carbon sinks anymore. They're carbon sources. Same with boreal forests. VPD is a massive factor in this equation related to climate engineering, and no one's acknowledging that. So, again, less plant growth, uh, plant dying, the, the effects of the UV radiation, which can cause leaf scorch and bark scorch. Uh, there's many, many signs of this. And we're simply asking, Robert, for people to investigate. We don't ask anybody to believe anything we say. We're saying, look at the film footage, look at the governmental documents, look at the patents, listen to the testimony of former Air Force generals and so forth. And we're just we're just asking them to look at the, the data and starting with the dimming documentary is a, is a great place to start. Dana Wigginton, thank you so much for your activism. Thanks for your integrity and your courage. And thanks for joining us today on the podcast. It's a pleasure and an honor. And, and thank you for giving a voice to this issue and encouraging those that follow you and all your courageous work to investigate this as well. Dana, how can our listeners support you? Just simply help to share our data and get us past social media censorship. Geoengineeringwatch.org is non-political. We don't advertise. Our only goal is to bring this issue to the full light of day. The public has a right to know. What's the name of the organization again? Geoengineeringwatch.org. It's important to put the watch part on because otherwise you go to a pro geoengineering website. So it's letters G-E-O, the word engineeringwatch.org. Ano Wigington, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for your courage, your integrity, for your activism. And thanks for trying to wake us all up.